Now, we showed you hour after hour of real-time evidence demonstrating every step of Donald Trump's constitutional crime. We showed you how he indoctrinated the mob with his Orwellian propaganda about how the election he lost by more than 7 million votes and 306 to 232 in the Electoral, in the electoral College, which he had described as a landslide when he won by the exact same margin in 2016, was actually a landslide victory for him being stolen away by a bipartisan conspiracy and fraud and corruption. We showed you how 61 courts and 88 judges, federal, state, local, trial, appellate, from the lowest courts in the land to the United States Supreme Court across the street, and eight federal judges he himself named to the bench, all found no basis in fact or law for his outlandish and deranged inventions and concoctions about the election. In the meantime, President Trump tried to bully state-level officials to commit a fraud on the public by literally finding votes. We examined the case study of Georgia, where he called to threaten Republican Brad Raffensperger to find him 11,780 votes. That's all he wanted, he said, 11,780 votes. Don't we all? 11,780 votes. That's all he wanted, to nullify Biden's victory and to win the election. Raffensperger ended up with savage death threats against him and his family, telling him he deserved a firing squad. Another election official urged Trump to cut it out or people would get hurt and killed. A prescient warning indeed. Raffensperger ended up saying that he and his family supported Donald Trump, gave him money, and now Trump threw us under the bus. We saw what happened in Lansing, Michigan, with the extremist mob he cultivated, which led to two shocking capital sieges and a criminal conspiracy by extremists to kidnap and likely assassinate Governor Whitmer. We saw him trying to get state legislatures to disavow and overthrow their popular election results and replace them with Trump electors. We showed you the process of summoning the mob, reaching out, urging people to come to Washington for a wild time. As we celebrate President's Day on Monday, think, imagine, is there another president in our history who would urge supporters to come to Washington for a wild time? You saw how he embraced the violent extremist elements like the Proud Boys, who were told in a nationally televised presidential candidate debate to stand back and stand by, which became their official slogan as they converged on Washington with other extremist and seditious groups and competed to be the lead stormtroopers of the attack on this building. You saw the assembly of the mob on January 6th, and how beautiful that angry mob must have looked to Donald Trump as he peered down from the lectern with the seal of the President of the United States of America emblazoned on it. That crowd was filled with extremists in tactical gear, armed to the teeth and ready to fight, and other brawling MAGA supporters, all of, this, all of them saying, stop the steal right now. And he said he was going to march with them to the Capitol, even though the permit for the rally specifically forbade a march, but he said he would march with them, giving them more comfort that what they were doing was legitimate. It was okay. But of course, he stayed back as he presumably didn't want to be too close to the action at the Capitol, as the lawyers called it. Not an insurrection, they urged us yesterday. It's an action. Um, he didn't want to be too close to the action when all hell was about to break loose. Now, Incitement, as we've discussed, requires an inherently fact-based evidentiary inquiry. And this is what we did. We gave you many hours of specific factual details about, to use Congresswoman Cheney's words, the president, how the president summoned the mob, assembled the mob, incited it, lit the match, sending them off to the Capitol, where they thought, as they yelled out, that they'd been invited by the President of the United States. And then, of course, they unleashed unparalleled violence against our overwhelmed and besieged but heroic police officers who you thoughtfully honored yesterday when the officers got in their way as they entered the Capitol at the behest of the President of the United States to stop the steal. 
Now, I'm convinced most senators must be convinced by this overwhelming and specific detail, because most Americans are. But say you still have your doubts. You think the president really thought that he was sending his followers uh, to participate in a peaceful, nonviolent rally, the kind that might have been organized by Julian Bond, who my distinguished opposing counsel brought up, Ella Baker, Bob Moses, our late beloved colleague John Lewis, for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Maybe the president really thought this was going to be like the March on Washington organized by Bayard Rustin and Dr. Martin Luther King, who said, nonviolence is the answer to the crucial moral and political questions of our time. So let's say you're still flirting with the idea that Donald Trump's conduct was totally appropriate, as he proclaimed uh, right off the bat, and he's the innocent victim of a mass accident or a catastrophe, like a fire or a flood, as we were invited uh, to frame it uh, on our opening day by uh, distinguished co-counsel or opposing counsel. And you think, maybe we're just looking for somebody to blame for this nightmare and catastrophe that has befallen the republic. We're just looking for someone to blame. Well, here's the key question then in resolving your doubts, if you're in that category. How did Donald Trump react when he learned of the violent storming of the Capitol and the threats to senators, members of the House, and his own vice president, as well as the images he saw on TV of the pummeling and beating and harassment of our police officers? Did he spring into action to stop the violence and save us? Did he even wonder about his own security since an out-of-control anti-government mob could come after him too? Did he quickly try to get in touch with or denounce the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers, the rally organizers, the Save, the Save America rally organizers, and everyone on the extreme right to tell them that this was not what he had in mind, it was a big mistake, call it off, call it off, call it off, as Representative Gallagher begged him to do on national television? No. He delighted in it. He reveled in it. He exulted in it. He could not understand why the people around him did not share his delight. And then a long period of silence ensued while the mob beat the daylights out of police officers and invaded this building, as you saw in security footage, and proceeded to hunt down Vice President Mike Pence as a traitor and denounced and cursed Speaker Pelosi, both of whom you heard mob members say they wanted to kill. They were both in real danger. And our government could have been thrown into absolute turmoil without the heroism of our officers and the bravery and courage of a lot of people in this room. Here's what Republican Representative Anthony Gonzalez of Ohio said. He's a former pro football player. We are imploring the president to help, to stand up, to help defend the United States Capitol and the United States Congress, which is under attack. We are begging, essentially, and he was nowhere to be found. Nowhere to be found. And as I've emphasized this morning, that dereliction of duty that desertion of duty was central to his incitement of insurrection and inextricable from it. Inextricable. Bound together. It reveals his state of mind that day, what he was thinking as he provoked the mob to violence and further violence. It shows how he perpetuated his continuing offense on January 6th, his course of conduct charged in the article of impeachment as he further incited the mob during the attack, aiming it at Vice President Mike Pence himself while failing to quell it in either of his roles as Commander-in-Chief or his real role that day, Inciter-in-Chief. And it powerfully demonstrates that the ex-president knew, of course, that violence was foreseeable, that it was predictable and predicted that day, since he was not surprised and not horrified, no, he was delighted, and through his acts of omission and commission that day, he abused his office by siding with the insurrectionists at almost every point, rather than with the Congress of the United States, rather than with the Constitution. In just a moment, my colleague, Mr. Cicilline, will address President Trump's conduct, his actions and inactions, his culpable state of mind during the attack as he will establish yesterday's explosive revelations about House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy's desperate call to Trump 
in Trump's truly astounding reaction confirm that Trump was doing nothing to help the people in this room or this building. It's now clear beyond doubt that Trump supported the actions of the mob. And so he must be convicted. It's that simple. When he took the stage on January 6th, he knew exactly how combustible the situation was. He knew there were many people in the crowd who were ready to jump into action, to engage in violence at any signal that he needed them to fight like hell, to stop the steal. And that's exactly what he told them to do. Then he aimed them straight here, right down Pennsylvania at the Capitol, where he told them that the steal was occurring, that is, the counting of the Electoral College votes. And we all know what happened next. They attacked this building. They disrupted the peaceful transfer of power. They injured and killed people convinced that they were acting on his instructions and with his approval and protection. And while that happened, he further incited them while failing to defend us. If that's not ground for conviction, if that's not a high crime and misdemeanor against the republic in the United States of America, then nothing is. President Trump must be convicted for the safety and security of our democracy and our people.